So indeed, the next uh, short session is going to be uh, a fireside chat with Sir Mark Malcolm Rifkind. Uh, Sir Mark Malcolm Rifkind is a British politician and a minister in Margaret Thatcher's and John Major's governments. In the uh, 1980s, he was responsible for Britain's relations with the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Currently a member of the eminent per uh, persons group of, uh, at the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. The group has reported on relations between Russia and the West multiple times. Sir Malcolm is also a member of the board uh, uh, of the Nuclear Threat Initiative in Washington, uh, D.C. He is joining us. Sir Malcolm, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm oh, sorry I can't be with you in person. Ah, th thank you, thank you very, thank you very much, Sir, Sir, Sir Malcolm. Um, have you, uh, you have been looking at the Central and Eastern Europe region for at least four uh, decades. As a Minister of State in the Foreign Office in the early 80s, you were responsible uh, for UK relations with uh, the region and the uh, Soviet Union. You also visited the region on numerous, numerous uh, occasions. 1984 is a memorable year where you met with uh, representatives of the then banned Solidarity Movement, but not the country le country's leader, General Jaruzelski. Uh, what, are you, what are your views on the region's transition since the fall of communism? Has it progressed? Well, as 1984 was certainly a very special year. And uh, of course, there was an additional reason which also involved me. I was working with Margaret Thatcher on the visit of Mikhail Gorbachev uh, to the United Kingdom, a very historic meeting as it turned out, uh, because uh, that was when Mrs. Thatcher concluded that Gorbachev was a man with whom she could do business. Uh, she made that remark also to President Reagan. And President Reagan, if he'd heard that from anybody else, might not have been very impressed. But hearing it from the Iron Lady, he thought, wow, this guy may be different. And we all know the consequences of, of that. So it was an extraordinary time in the 1980s. I was very fortunate in being involved uh, in these matters. Uh, and uh, the visit to Warsaw that you mentioned uh, was particularly important because it was in the immediate aftermath of the uh, murder of Father Popolushko. And I had also said I would meet Solidarity. We, we had, they were a banned organization at that time. And it was because of that meeting uh, against the wishes of the Polish government that Jaruzelski, I think he was expecting to see me, but he said uh, he, uh, no question of any meeting. They were very angry. Now, the significance, I'll just make one comment on that, maybe of interest to your, your other viewers, uh, that my, I was only a deputy minister, minister of state at that time. Uh, what really made the impact was because I'd had that meeting, Hans Dietrich Genscher, uh, the following week was due to visit Warsaw, and at that time it had no intention of meeting Solidarity. Uh, because of the publicity surrounding my own meeting, he changed his program. And from that moment onwards, although they were banned, uh, the Polish uh, government, had to, the communist government, had to put up with the fact that if they wanted ministers from NATO countries to visit Poland, meetings with Solidarity would be part of the program. And it was only a few months later that the ban on Solidarity was removed, and we all know what that led to. That's a, a few introductory comments, as it were, arising out of your question. You said, what's my reaction now? You know, here we are a good number of years later. And, uh, with all the necessary qualifications, I have to say, of course, it's turned out dramatically better than anything that seemed likely in the 1980s. Because at that time, we still had the, the uh, Soviet Union controlling the destinies of all these uh, countries. And what we have seen is not only that now they are all independent countries, they are members of NATO, the members of the European Union, and firmly part of, of the international community, and particularly the Western community, by their own choice. We've seen that, but in a sense, it corrects a historic wrong, because these are countries that resumed their independence after the First World War, or became independent states for the first time. Uh, Poland, uh, Hungary, the Czech Republic, uh, and the Baltic states, of course. So that was cruelly interrupted by, first of all, Hitler, uh, and then uh, the decision of the Soviet Union, uh, not only to dominate these countries, but to impose communism upon them, and to make them effectively satellite states. 
So what happened at the end of the 1980s, with the end of the Cold War, uh, was also the, the, as it were, the restoration of uh, true independence uh, to these uh, satellite countries, and in the case of the Baltic states, uh, actually resuming their uh, formal status as independent countries. So that, that hasn't changed, despite all the recent problems. So uh, I, that is something which we can take enormous pleasure uh, and it has transformed the lives of tens of millions of people who live in those countries and helped them realize their historic destiny. Uh, do you think we appreciate the, uh, that, that enough and as, as people of Central and Eastern Europe? Well, you know, this is what I'm about to say doesn't just apply to the countries of Eastern Europe. Uh, the generation that lived through these changes, the generations that remembered what it was like beforehand, for them, it remains an incredible period of their lives and something they knew was not inevitable in terms of timing. Uh, it, it could have taken a lot longer. It could have been much more bloody uh, and it wasn't. It was a peaceful transition for the most part. Uh, and uh, I think Gorbachev, though he may not be very popular in, in Russia, uh, he deserves the accolade of the person without whom it couldn't have happened. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan obviously were crucial, but you needed somebody at that time in Moscow prepared not just to accept the inevitability and the desirability of these countries resuming their independence, but allowing it to happen in an overwhelmingly peaceful uh, way. And of course, there was also simultaneously uh, the disintegration of the Soviet Union itself, the implosion of the Soviet Union into 15 different countries that we are still living with the consequences of, particularly in Ukraine. Uh, when you look at the current geopolitical situation, it seems that uh, a lot of challenges that we that the region faced 40 years uh, ago still remain. What further steps should the region take? We uh, must be aware of the temptation of thinking it simply as a region, as if all the countries in that region are the same. And they're not. They're, they're dramatically different, uh, not just in terms of their uh, culture and their history, but also some of them have less friendly relations with each other. Uh, fortunately, a lot better within the framework of the EU and of NATO, uh, but nevertheless, some of these tensions still exist. Uh, and of course, uh, also, uh, there is not just the question of their governments and their political independence. Uh, what we have seen is a transformation in the social and cultural values that operate within these countries, and it varies from country to country. And some of these, as we know, have caused considerable strains uh, within their relationship with the European Union uh, and uh, with the NATO to a lesser degree. Uh, so in the case of the European Union, uh, clearly uh, circumstances that exist at the moment, particularly in Hungary, but also to some degree in Poland, fairly or unfairly, are seen in many parts of Europe as a slide towards a more authoritarian government, not back to communism. No one talks in those terms, no one's remotely interested in that. But back to an authoritarian system of government, which, uh, however might, much it might seem natural to many of the residents of those countries and their governments, uh, seems unnatural uh, in most of the rest of Europe, uh, where what we call liberal democracy uh, and uh, open society and liberal values are largely taken for granted. They're not unanimous, but they are the dominant culture and have been for a long time of these countries. Uh, less so in some of the new uh, democracies of Central and Eastern uh, Europe. Now, I personally make a distinction between uh, attempts to create a more authoritarian system, which I deeply deplore. Uh, I think it's incompatible with European values to directly or indirectly uh, have forms of censorship, forms of government control that prevent uh, free political uh, competition, the rule of law being tampered with. Uh, these are things I deplore, and I think it's going to be very difficult uh, for uh, Hungary and Poland, which are the two countries that have been accused of these things, perhaps unfairly, but that's uh, the reality. Um, th th that's going to be a difficult challenge. I think it's a slightly different circumstance when the issues that it seem to divide some of the countries of Eastern Europe with the countries of uh, Western Europe are in relation to personal values, social values. I'm thinking, for example, of all the changes that have taken place with regard to uh, what is called the gay community, uh, same sex, uh, marriages, uh, uh, respect for homosexual act, uh, uh, preference, 
uh, uh, abortion, uh, uh, issues of that kind. I say that this is difficult and, and different <clears throat> because I think sometimes in Western Europe, uh, we forget that, yes, we've liberalized in all these areas. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, uh, I can remember 30 years ago in the United Kingdom, the idea of same-sex marriages would have been seen as abhorrent to 90% of the population, if not 90%, certainly a large majority. <clears throat> it, would, it would have seemed unnatural. Uh, and so in that area and in other areas, it's, it's over a long, it's over, it's been over at least a generation, a couple of generations, for these values to become the new, as it were, norm uh, of Western European countries. Uh, another example, if I may, where it's taken a long time have been the problems in part of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. Uh, the, 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 the long history of enmity, hatred uh, between many in the Protestant and Catholic communities in Northern Ireland, uh, which doesn't exist anywhere else in Europe, either Western Europe or Eastern Europe, in, in that way. Uh, and at first, it, it, and for a period of years, it, it involved terrorism, it involved violence. Uh, and since uh, the last 20 or so years, that has largely disappeared and therefore things are not great, but they're a heck of a lot better than they've ever been for a long, long time. So if it's taken Western Europe uh, to ch change its views, I think we should be more, uh, uh, not tolerance is the wrong word, that's a rather patronizing word. I think we should be more understanding that there are debates going on in Poland and Hungary, as in many other countries in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, uh, as to whether the social and uh, personal changes in people's lives on these rather sensitive matters, whether that's been relevant and healthy or whether it needs to be debated further. Uh, over the last almost four months, we have been witnessing events that Europe hasn't seen in almost 80 years. Uh, we have unbelievable, unbelievable resistance in Ukraine and a lot of countries in the region, but also outside helping quite a lot. Do you think we are doing enough? Well, I'm wonderfully surprised and exhilarated uh, by the way in which on this occasion, not always in the past, on this occasion, uh, Europe, the United States, the United Kingdom have not only been very resilient and very uh, much involved, uh, but they have done things that wouldn't even have been con seriously contemplated <coughs> uh, six or seven years ago at the time of the annexation of Crimea uh, and uh, the beginnings of the separatist uh, movement in the in the Donbass. Uh, so, uh, of course, it, it is because no one now is in any doubt that Mr. Putin is a bad man. And let's remember, this is not Russia that took this decision to invade Ukraine. It wasn't even the Russian government, and, and that implies a collective decision. It was a decision of one man who has more power in Russia than anyone since uh, Stalin. And he made a, a terrible strategic mistake. I mean, he probably, to some degree, realizes that now uh, in the, the assumptions he made as to what would happen. Uh, but not only have we seen and it's an incredible uh, resilience of the Ukrainian people under their government. Mr. Zelensky is, is a, the new Mandela <laughs> of the world. Uh, he, one man who, by his own personal strength and character and integrity, has inspired, literally inspired, uh, millions of people outside Ukraine uh, to see this as a just war that he is fighting and his people are fighting against an unjustified in, in invasion. So that has been marvelously impressive and to some degree it, it has worked. It's not yet complete. Uh, but you know, we all know that Putin's intention was to eliminate Ukraine as an independent country, to control Kiev, to eliminate the government. And he has been not only humiliated, he's been defeated in that objective. So now it's still terribly serious. Uh, Zelensky says Ukraine now controls 80% of its territory. Well, you know, it's going to be very difficult, uh, but let's hope they achieve that. They've already achieved miracles. I was once told that miracles take longer, you know, uh, but they do happen uh, and it, they have been happening. So that, that is very impressive. But what has also been equally impressive has been the reaction uh, of uh, the rest of Europe uh, and, the, and, and the United States, of course, uh, and uh, the provision of military equipment to the Ukrainians. Without that, 
however brave and courageous they were, they could not have hoped to have achieved what they have already achieved. Um, and that is continuing. Now, that is now, it's not working perfectly, but by God, you know, none of us would have dreamt it would work at all uh, a few short weeks or months ago. Um, in addition to that, we have this extraordinary irony uh, that uh, Putin likes to claim, I don't believe it was his main reason, but he likes to claim that it was the expansion of NATO uh, that has most uh, alarmed uh, the Kremlin and himself, uh, which justifies his current response. It is one of the strangest ironies of modern history that the direct consequence uh, of a conflict which he says uh, was about the enlargement of NATO uh, has led to uh, Sweden and Finland uh, now deciding to join NATO. Uh, Sweden, which has been a neutral state for 200 years, uh, Finland since the Second World War, and both explicitly saying it, they now sadly find it necessary to protect their own uh, identity and security. Uh, and that has profound impact on the ability of the new member states of, of NATO to be defended. I'm thinking particularly of the Baltic states, because until now, uh, if there was a crisis, uh, involving the Baltic states and Russian aggression, then the reinforcement of the Baltic states was always going, not to be impossible, it would have happened, but it would be difficult because of the Suwalki gap being the only physical way of doing that between Kaliningrad and Belar on one side and Belarus on the other. Uh, now, one, when Finland in particular is a member state, uh, the Baltic Sea is then a sea, 95% of which has NATO territory. The only exceptions are that small part of the Russian Federation around St. Petersburg, very small coastal strip, and Kaliningrad. Uh, the, the rest of the coastland of the whole of the Baltic Sea uh, belongs to member states of NATO. And therefore the ability to reinforce the Baltics directly through uh, Finland and Sweden, Gotland and so forth, in a way that would not have been legally possible uh, until now. Uh, that is one of the other uh, direct consequences of the strategic genius of Vladimir Putin. How do you see the future of the emerging Europe region and its role in the global arena going uh, forward? Well, the countries concerned have by their own choice uh, chosen to make their destiny one that involves NATO but also the European Union. And so to some significant degree, uh, which now, of course, does not apply to the United Kingdom for reasons that we're all familiar with. Uh, for some significant degree, their relationship with the wider world uh, will be part of however the EU itself evolves uh, as a, it's not a global power, it's a global economic power at the moment, the European Union. It's not a global political power. Uh, and it's not a global military power. It has no military role at all in any real sense. But that can change if we're talking about the next 10, 20, 30 years. Whether it's good for it to change, that's for the people of the European Union to decide. That's no longer something I and my fellow citizens are directly involved with. But we, we will watch with very deep interest. Uh, so that's part of it. Um, but uh, unle unless the European Union was to become the United States of Europe, and I don't think it will go that far, certainly not in the lifetime of anyone around at the moment, unless that did happen, uh, then of course the individual countries of the EU preserve their right, not just their opportunity, uh, to adapt their foreign policy in ways that may not be the same as the rest of uh, the member states of the EU. We've seen France and Germany <clears throat> do just that and from time to time. Uh, and if they can do it, then others can do it as well, as Mr. Orban in Hungary has demonstrated. Sir Malcolm, thank you very much for joining us on this occasion and I'm hopeful that there will be another um, opportunities to discuss the future of emerging Europe region. Thank you thank very you much. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to that happening.